Hello, everyone, and welcome back to One on One, a very special One on One. I'm Thomas Isle, honoring the Fordham men's basketball team from 1971, 26 and three, ended up ninth in the country. And I am now joined by former assistant coach on that Digger Phelps led team, Fordham administrator, athletic director, Fordham Hall of Famer, Frank McLaughlin. Frank, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day well, to talk. Yeah, about it's going to be team. a special weekend. We're all, and, and everybody's coming. It's going to be great. It's going to be a great weekend. And we're so excited that uh, our uh, basketball team is doing so well. So hopefully we have a great weekend. We beat Rhode Island. Well, it's been over 50 years since Fordham's had a season like they're having this year. But you were actually part of that 1971 team. But you were also a player before you became an assistant under Digger Phelps. And you happened to play with, with Charlie Elverton. What did you notice about him? the first time you became his teammate on the varsity squad? Well, it was, it was uh, pretty, pretty interesting. When I was, uh, uh, when I was an undergraduate and playing, I uh, sort of helped out on recruiting too. So uh, I helped recruit Charlie from uh, Brother Rice High School. Uh, his high school coach was a Fordham graduate, uh, Mike Brown, a uh, very intelligent guy and stuff like that. So, uh, Rice had a special team. They had, uh, you know, Dean Meminger and Charlie Elverton and, and Charlie decided to come to Fordham and, uh, had a, he had a, a very good career, but that, that, that last year was very special. It made it a great, great career. So. Now, from what I understand as well, the team was 10 and 15 the year before Digger showed up, you had graduated and then you became an assistant. When Digger arrived that first week and he was asked, why would you pick Fordham? And he said, well, they already know how to lose. Now I'm going to teach them how to win. What did that signal to you about the direction and the vision that he had to bring the program to new heights? Well, first of all, everybody was shocked when Digger Phelps was named uh, the coach of Fordham because nobody knew who the hell he was. And uh, he was a very successful assistant at Penn. Um, and then, uh, they, they created a full-time assistance position, which they had never had before. And because the pay was so low and nobody's interested in the job, Digger had to settle on me. So it was really, uh, we didn't know each other before I, I took the job. And uh, we just had a great, great relationship. But he was charismatic. He came in uh, and, uh, you know, just built positive energy. And uh, everybody, now we had a good team. I mean, there's, you know, I mean, the record before might have been 10 and 15, but they lost some close games and they were young. But uh, it's it just a, a great blend of a charismatic coach with very good players uh, that uh, believed that they were going to win. And uh, it, it was amazing to me. We started the year and, you know, we beat Yale and we beat Syracuse and we beat Seton Hall. And then, then we went on the, on the road, which is hard. But to win at Miami, I think the thing about this thing is, if you look at that schedule they played, it was unbelievable. The road wins they had at Miami, at Florida, uh, at UMass. I mean, they had some great, great road road wins. So uh, they 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 were a team that sort of just uh, meshed together and all believed in each other and uh, really overachieved. Do you remember or do you recall rather the first interaction you had behind closed doors with Digger? Uh, I, I, he was very, it was interesting because I was working at Holy Cross with Jack Dunahue, who was a Fordham grad. And a lot of people thought Jack Dunahue was going to get the Fordham job. And uh, that spring, I was offered a job at Clemson, uh, which uh, there was, was coach Tate's lock who was very successful. So I was going to take that job and then Digger met with me and he, he, this is how convincing it was. He says, you know, if you go down to Clemson, you're going to be the third assistant. You come to Fordham, you're going to be my only assistant. And, and you're so young, you're going to get coaching experience by coaching the freshman team. So Digger convinced me. And, and it's very funny that one of Digger's best friends was a high school coach in New York and he turned the job down. And because it didn't pay so well. And for years, we see each other. And he said, my God, I can't believe how stupid I was. If I had taken that job a year later, I would have been the assistant at Notre Dame. But uh, 
So, uh, yeah, Digger, Digger was great. He was just really enthusiastic, uh, reached out to the students, and uh, it, it, we became uh, the, the pride of New York. I mean, it was just unbelievable. You know, New York City people have a great respect for Fordham as an academic institution. They know Fordham is really great. And then athletically, they, they want to root for us because they know we have very good student athletes. So uh, it just meshed. And then uh, we, we ended up winning some games. Uh, I, I think the, uh, beating UMass at UMass was a phenomenal game. Nobody beat UMass at uh, Kerry Hicks Cage, and they had Julia Serving. And then uh, Charlie Elton had a career game, which really got him a very high draft pick because – of the way he played against Julius. And uh, then we came back and we, uh, you know, you tell people, oh, we're gonna play Notre Dame in the garden, it's gonna sell out. People thought you were crazy. College basketball then did not sell out, but we sold out uh, the Notre Dame game and uh, beat Notre Dame 94, 88. It was sort of interesting. I, I had scouted Notre Dame. We were a pressing team. And uh, I came back from Chicago and, uh, Digger says, well, what do you think and stuff? And I said, you know, I think we should zone them. And we hadn't played zone at all, at all. But the only teams that Notre Dame lost to that year were zone teams. So we surprised them. We started in a zone and caught them off guard. And Billy Maynard, who's a great, great defensive player. So at halftime, when we switched back to man-to-man, Maynard had no fouls. So he was really able to shut down Austin Carr and and do a great job and then the following thursday we played marquette number two team in the country took them to overtime sell out crowd i mean it was so popular that abc radio which didn't do games did the games with marv albert there was so much interest in it so so you talk about having the city by its horns and some of the names that you guys had you already mentioned bill Maynard, but and Charlie Elverton, but Kenny Charles was also a part of this team. And now he was originally going to go to Columbia. He admitted in an interview recently with Ed Randall on Fordham Athletics uh, YouTube page. But when Ken Charles showed up and he was a sophomore on the varsity team that year, as the second leading scorer, did anyone really expect him to elevate to the sort of player he was that, that first real season on varsity? Well, Kenny played at a Jesuit high school, Brooklyn Prep. Uh, his coach uh, was a good friend and, and very helpful. And I think he helped us uh, get Kenny. Uh, and that, that's a, another interesting point. We were playing and we were winning. And then we had a big game against Holy Cross in early January. And Holy Cross was very good. I had worked there the year before, uh, but they were very big and slow. And so we ended up deciding to put Kenny Charles. That's the first game he started. And it was the first time uh, that we used four guards. And it became very successful. Holy Cross just couldn't cover us. I think the score was 29 to 2 at the beginning of the game. It was like unbelievable, you know. So, uh, yeah, that was a very big – that that Holy Cross game was a turning point because that's the first time Kenny uh, became uh, a starter. So who was starting in Ken Charles's place before he moved – uh, I believe it was George Zambetti. George who, Zambetti. Who was a very integral part of the team and stuff like that, you know. Because you don't really need five guys. You need seven guys, eight guys, you know, to 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 play. But it, it just so happened with the matchups, uh, you know, how that worked out. So the first loss actually came uh, against Temple, at, against Chief Litwack, and who's a very, very respected coach both at Temple and in the world of college basketball. When you went to play legends, all these coaching icons, young Bob Knight at Army, Chuck Daly at Boston College, Al McGuire, this one, Johnny D, every single night, and you were walking in there with a 28-year-old head coach named Digger, yourself just essentially out of college, a very young staff. Did that ever bother you guys a little bit? Like, wow, we're really going up against great coaches and they were uh, never great. never entered our minds we no? were just uh young enthusiastic and thought we could beat anybody and matter of fact the temple game that we lost i think it was 67 66 and uh charlie elverton played the game but he was sick that game so we lost by one point and if charlie was healthy we probably would have won that game 
And when you guys looked at Yelverton, his numbers the year before were not what they were his senior year, but they were they were decent numbers. When he exploded into eventually the 1971 Haggerty Award winner, did you guys ever expect him to have that sort of leap? Because I know Digger admitted a while ago that he had a good feeling about the team, but I don't think he really envisioned what you guys had achieved that year. Did you expect Yelverton to take a leap like that, or did you sort of try to maybe ease him in a little bit more? Uh, I don't think we expected it. We knew he was very good, but as the season went on, everybody overachieved. I'll tell you, Jackie Burek, the point guard, who was also a great baseball player, he was a hard-nosed guy and a great leader on the floor. He got those guys organized. We, we just had a great Tommy Sullivan. He had 6'4", left-handed kid from St. Helena's High School in the Bronx. He came there, and it, he was quick as a cat. And when he was back at the press, he would anticipate and, and make steals and stuff. And, and then people would thought they could take the ball to the basket against him because he was only 6'4", but he could really jump. So he, he would block some shots. So uh, everybody on that team, I believe, uh, overachieved. Bart Water, which was a young kid from Jersey, he came in and they all complimented each other. It was a, it was, it was a great feeling. So I'll ask you this, because I know right now with Keith Ergo's team, the big thing we see with them beyond the on-court product is culture and a culture around Fordham athletics and the basketball team specifically. You guys had that as well for one season. How important is it to build a culture for people not only to come to your games and care, but sort of have a team to identify with and, and call their own? And what did that have you guys sort of thinking as the season went on? I, I uh, it's funny because I watch this year's team and I go to the games and stuff, and it's it, it's similar in some ways in the sense of uh, the expectation level was not high, they're overachieving and they've created a great institutional pride. You know, there's places you go now, you wear a Fordham cap, everybody says, "Oh, you guys have a great basketball team." You know, you guys, uh, you know, beat St. Bonaventure. You guys are doing this, are doing that, and. Uh, it, it was reminiscent of the 70-71 team that really captivated New York. Uh, it was uh, every way you went, uh, people knew and respected Fordham. Now, Frank, if you track down the seasons in college basketball in New York City, a couple come to mind, the 85 St. John's team, the 1971 Fordham team. There's a couple others, I'm sure, that are up there. Some Seton Hall runs, P.J. Carlissimo, of course, in the early late eighties, mid early nineties, where would you rank the 1971 Fordham season among the great seasons in the history of New York uh, college basketball? It's got to be up near the top. I mean, I'm, I'm sure it's in, in the top five. I'm not trying to St. John's had a great run in the final four and stuff like that. Seton Hall, PJ's team went, went to the final four, but uh, Fordham's team is up there in, in, in the top five. And you know, if you look at the season, we lost to Temple, uh, Charlie was sick. We played Villanova, uh, and we ended up losing by 10. Villanova was second in the country. Uh, and, and in that game, I, looking back on it, Charlie got three fouls and we took him out. I guess if we knew what the hell we were doing, we probably would have kept them in the game to see if we could get a chance to win. Uh, and then of course, Villanova had a forfeit that game. Uh, because they had illegal players in Howard Porter and stuff like that. So, I mean, you're talking about a team that played a great, great schedule, won great road games. Uh, so 26 and three and really 27 and two. Um, it, it, it was extraordinary. And losing to a Villanova team that ended up uh, playing UCLA in the championship. Now, coming back over 50 years later to celebrate this team specifically at the Rose Hill Gym, and is expected that Charlie Elverton's number is going to be retired, raised to the rafters next to Ed Conlon, Kenny Charles, Mullins, and all those guys. For him and Dan his... Gregory O'Connell, who is no, let's not the forget yes. players at Fordham. Let's not forget Ann Gregory. That's absolutely correct. Uh, but to see his number go up and to sort of reunite with everybody on Saturday, what are you most looking forward to? And what's the one thing that you're really going to remember uh, as – the ceremony is going to take place. Well, first of all, Charlie's number would have been retired much sooner, except for the fact that he lives in Italy and he, you know, he wasn't coming. If he ever came to New York, 
we would have retired his number sooner. But uh, it worked in great with this. Uh, a real tribute to this is every single person is coming. I mean, Digger's coming from South Bend. Everybody is going out of their way uh, to be there. So I think it it, 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 it says uh, it's a great tribute to Charlie. It's a great tribute to Fordham and how much uh, Fordham meant to all of these people. And it's a great tribute to show you what kind of a team it was that this 50 years later, there's still a very strong bond. Well, no one embodies the spirit of Fordham University better than Mr. Frank McLaughlin. Frank, thank you so much for the time. All right, great. And, and it's great to see the institutional pride back at Fordham. We'll be right back here on One on One.